Bibles to Psalm 8, which is on page 826 in the few Bibles, on page 826, then I want to read to you that whole psalm. Uh, you know, I, I do, because of my consciousness of time, need to know what time it is right now. 11.31. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm not I'm time conscious, I reckon, because uh, I know that uh, I need to be. This psalm, to me, is one of the greatest psalms in the entire uh, psalter. Uh, it's a psalm that uh, David expressed, and I think under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, no doubt, David expressed the value of human life. And I'd like to read it to you in its entirety. If you're ready. O Lord our God, O Lord our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. And this is what gets to me from here on. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, and the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Our generation the generation that you and I are in now is faced with the issue of the sanctity of human life as no generation before it has ever faced. People are killed for the change in their pockets. Violent crimes are escalated each year. Rape Murder, beatings. A medical doctor openly admits that he helped a woman commit suicide. The child abuse increases each year. The abuse of elderly patients in, in nursing homes has been the subject of a network documentary. Abortion is a, as a substitute for a contraception has become the accepted norm among many couples and many folks. Is there an end to this business? Is there an end to the erosion of the sanctity of human life? Because it's happening. Psalm 8 gives us three facets of human life that distinguishes it from other, all other life on the face of this earth. The first of these principles is found in verses 3 and 5, 3 through 5, 3 through 4. And that is that human life is sacred because it's special. It's not that it's sacred because it produces a special person that you marry or that you bear as a child. It is special because you are a human being. And I want you to understand that and see how, he, he, how David raises that question. He raised that question, what is man? And he was pondering at that moment the value of human life. He used two words for that. 
When I consider thy, the he thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man, what is mortal man, a person who's going to die, what is a mortal man that thou art mindful of? And what is the son of man that thou visitest him? You see, I think that you'll find that this word mortal man in a generic sense means all of humanity. All of it. What is mankind? What is it? In the second, in the second sense, he uses the word son of man, which is the word Adam in, in Hebrew. Just like the man that was put in the Garden of Eden to start with. That was his name, man. <clears throat> he reminds us that we are from the dust of the earth made by God. We are made by God. Why should man, why should God be concerned about man? We're frail. We may live 85 to 90 years old. Occasionally somebody will be as old as Miss Atta Good down in the southern part of the county. 108. It would be this. It it'll be some occasional when that happens. But we are made of dust, from dust. The answer is wrapped up in these two words, or in these words. It is that God made us in His image. God made us in His image. How can God be do that? Why could he be concerned about man who's so frail, who's so humble, who's so moral, who's so made of the dust? And the answer is wrapped up in, in, these, in two words, those two words that I gave you. God made us in his likeness, folks. The scripture talks about the hands of God. It talks about the feet of God. It talks about the bowels of mercy from God. It talks about his God's head. It talks about his eyes. He talks about all of these things because we put it in mortal sense because he made us in his image. But that image is mortal and that image is physical. But giving us a spiritual dimension, don't ever forget that. That you and I have spiritual a spiritual dimension. And folks, I don't care how much Peter tells you, there is no goat, there is no fox, there is no squirrel, there is no ape, there is no elephant that is made like we are with a spiritual dimension. They're not there. According to the psalmist, God gave us three features that separates us from the other life that's on earth. The first is, we are the only creatures made in His image. God is spiritual. God's image is spiritual. God's image is moral. God's image is immortal. Being stamped on every human being that is born. I want to tell you, in a personal experience, that whenever I went to the hospital up in Tifton for the birth of my grandchild that I eat, eat supper with on Monday and Friday nights, when I saw that baby I saw what I thought was something that could not live. But when I see this baby right now, I see her as somebody made in God's image. A beautiful girl. Certainly she has some images, that, some things that are wrong with her legs and with her sinews. But a beautiful girl with a voice that charms Coolidge Baptist Church every Sunday morning and Sunday night as she leads singing for us. 
I listen to all of that and I see in her that even after the fall of man in the Garden of, in the Garden of Eden, the image of God is stamped on every person. Man, and the second thing, man is the only creature that's described as being personally formed by God. I want you to understand that. Everything else is created by divine command. But God forms us. Doesn't he say in the Psalms that it's wonderful that he was made in his mother's womb, that God formed us in his mother's womb. Everything else, God said, let there be, and it was. But it's wonderful that he said, let us make man in our image. We have that image stamped on us. And folks, sometimes it's hard to understand somebody else, some other image, made image God, of God's image that we don't like. Why in the world does he make, did he make those people that disgust us? Why did he do that? God, in his wisdom, formed that person. We are the only ones formed. The others were beat, were beat, were, came into being. The third, man and only man has an inbreathed soul that comes to us. Only man. God breathed into Adam the breath of life and he lived. We have that for us. Then there's a second thing about mankind that makes life so important for us, and that is that, sacred, that the human life is sacred because it is a singular creative work of God. Look at verse 5. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Now folks, listen carefully. Each person is a singular creative work of God. There is nobody else on the face of this earth that looks like you, that talks like you. You are you. Now, I go to sit to the movies sometime or on television and I watch those movies and I'll say, you know, that looks like, I'm going to just pick a name out of the air. That looks like uh, uh, Clay Clay. There's a guy there that does look like in the capital movies that looks like Clay. Each person has a singular, a singular creative word of God. It came that you're different. There's something about you that's different. Now wait a minute. I want you to understand that the whole of the human family bears witness. That every life is a unique work, unique work of God. Think about how criminals are caught, and how we know that somebody was at the scene of a crime. Do you know how it is? Two things: if there's blood left, there comes to be DNA. If there's a hair off his head, it comes to be DNA. If there's if there's a scratch. On a person, and you can receive some, it comes because of DNA. There is not another DNA that's in the world like Clay Roberts. There's not another person in the world like my wife, Robbie. There's another, not another person in the world like my nightmare, my greatest fear in the whole world. And she's laughing. I want you to understand that. But that's not all. There's nobody else that bears the mark that's in my hand right here. You find it there, there, and there, and there, and there. I was talking the other day 
uh, with uh, our police chief down in, Mold, down in uh, Norman Park. And I said, aren't you afraid to, to, to go up to a car when you stop it? Aren't you, don't you ever get afraid of that? And he said, no. I can look in that mirror. I come right beside the car. I can look in that mirror and I can see that driver. I said, what do you do when you get there? He said, what the first thing I do is to touch that car with his hand. I said, why do you do that? I should have known better. Fingerprints. That's why, because nobody has any fingerprint like you. <coughs> nobody in the world. You see, God does not make duplicates at all in human beings. You're all different. If you, you mothers, you want to say, well, well, that baby was was formed in my in my womb. That's true. Well, the next baby ought to be formed the same way. That's wrong. <coughs> Nobody is like you in the whole world. The Bible tells us so. You remember the story of uh, Esther? She was a unique person who came to the kingdom in just such a time as this, as as, as uh, Esther's uncle said. Who knows? You may have come into the kingdom at this particular time. You, beautiful you, pretty you, you who rose to be the queen of all of Persia. Jeremiah called, was, was called from the womb to be a prophet. While he was in the womb, Jeremiah says that God called him to be a prophet. That old adage is very true. No one can do your God-given assignment in this world but you. There are people who can spot that, and they do that every day in this country. Somebody stops it by shooting them, shooting somebody. Or a car wreck happens. There are all kinds of things that stop that assignment. But only one person that can do what you can do, and nobody else. What one person does affects others for good or evil, and no one lives alone in this world. Now look at the last thing. Human life is sacred because it's a stewardship from God. And I want you to listen to this. Those of you who have pets like my wife has, <coughs> And I have to, I have to admit, part heart for that. I want you to understand these last verses. They don't have a they don't have a soul. They're not created with God with a God soul, God given soul. But they are taken care of by us. Listen to this: Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, <coughs> and whatsoever passeth through the waters or the paths of the seas. A wonderful work that's sacred. That life, human life, is sacred because it's a stewardship from God. According to the account of creation in Genesis 6 through 8, we can see this. God made man with the authority to rule over all of creation. All of it. Human beings are stewards and not owners of creation, including your own life. Because one day, you're going to face, like all human beings do, the fact that there's no more bread that you're going to breathe. No more. It's going to happen. One makes choices about his life without regard for God or others sometimes. And those choices hurt. They hurt you inside because God, because, because you're trying to hurt God. Or it 
hurts you outside because you're trying to hurt somebody else. We may make choices about life in regard to what God is and how they work. And we can say, that guy's not going to heaven. And, that, and then we say, that was, he, was just a, he was a good old guy, meaning he's at heaven. No, it doesn't work quite like that. You see, no one is exempt from the responsibility of the choices that he makes. And everyone that you ever see will be held accountable to God for those choices that he makes. Every human life is a sacred trust that is given to us from God. You, leave out, you, you can leave out human accountability. You can leave out the sacredness of human life. And you find that it is compromised in that way. But when we become no more, but no, then we become no more than animals. And I want to tell you as an English teacher something to illustrate what I'm trying to say to you. As an English teacher, I had it drummed into my head that we were not humans. We were human beings. Because human beings have a body, which is human, and they have a being, which is spiritual. And whenever people say humans, they're degrading you. They're leaving out the fact that you're going to live forever. They're leaving out the fact that you have a being that comes from God. I have marked essays that were written in class for my classes. I have marked out human many a time and written in red ink so that they could see it. Human beings. That's what it is human being. Now, why is that important? Because as a being, you're going to live forever. As a human, you're going to rot and decay. And that's what it's going to be. You see, we then become no more than animals whenever that happens. We see the symptoms of such a loss of divine perspective are things like violence and crime and loss of human rights and sexual permissiveness, and sexual perversions, and abortion, and homosexuality, and euthanasia, and maybe, and mercy killings, all of those things, <coughs> does away with the human <coughs> being part of us. <coughs> Seldom does the debate of abortion, for instance, Focus on the responsibility to God. The two people, when they generate a human life through their choice, have exempted God from the problem. And that life is a responsibility. This is a wonderful psalm to me because it tells us where we as human beings stand. When I consider the heaven. <clears throat> and the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, is how it's ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. You made him to have dominion over the works of the sea, works of thy hands. Thou hast put all not all things under his feet, <coughs> all sheep, all oxen. Yea, the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. My folks, I love you because you're a human being. I love what you are as a human, and I love you as you are as a being, especially. You're precious in God's sight. You were created. There was nobody created like you and won't ever be anybody created like you. You are precious in God's sight. And all these people that we know are. We used to teach us, teach the kids that by a little song that everybody is precious in his sight. Red and yellow, black and white. Precious in his sight. And that's the truth. 
may God bless us as we go from here to deal with other human beings. And as we deal with human beings, know that we are <coughs> dealing with the image of God. That person is in the image of God. Thank you. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you did make us to be unique. You made us to be your children. You created us in your image. And you want that image to be ours for a long, long time in eternity. And you sent your Son to redeem those of us who have sinned and who has not sinned. And we pray that you would let us understand that we need to recognize inside ourselves that Jesus, the Savior, is walking beside us through the Holy Spirit, and he brings us to God for confession that we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and that he lives with you forever. We pray this prayer.